The internet has changed the way we live. It has changed the way we work, the way we shop, and even the way we date. It has also changed the way we kill. I'm Donald McIntyre, and I'm on a quest to explore the dark side of our online world, where one click can lead to murder. The internet and social media has been a godsend to online predators. Why? Because of the speed in which they can, one, create fake profiles, but two, access victims. I'll be investigating some of the most disturbing crimes in recent history, where the internet and social media have been used to trick, torture and kill innocent victims, lured into a virtual world where nothing is as it seems. Clearly, she did not realise the person she was talking to online was the man who was going to kill her. In this programme, 15-year-old A-star student Joshua Davies seemed the perfect boyfriend for 14-year-old Rebecca Aylward. But when they broke up, he waged a 10-month online war, which ended with him brutally murdering his ex-girlfriend. When Davies told his friends online that he was going to kill Rebecca, they didn't think he was serious. They even egged him on. Are we now in a world where teenagers can't draw a line between fiction and reality? A world where social media can help a youngster talk himself into committing a brutal murder. These days, when teenagers meet and get together at school, increasingly they're conducting their relationships online, with sites like Facebook being used to keep their peers updated about how the relationship is going 24-7. This was the case with Year 10 students Joshua Davies and Rebecca Aylward. They had an intense but brief relationship, and when they broke up, Davies was determined to save face. He made no secret of his hatred for Rebecca. And nearly 14 months after they started dating, on October 23rd, 2010, he took her to a forest and murdered her. I'm on my way to Aberkenvig near Bridgend in Wales, where Joshua Davies lived and where Rebecca Aylward was murdered in 2010. And I want to discover the role social media played in transforming a seemingly model student into a brutal and callous killer. Like most teenage girls, Rebecca, known as Becca to her friends and family, was into social media and boys. She was a bright girl with a wide circle of friends and dreamed of becoming a lawyer. To me, Becca was my best friend. When I first met Becca, I thought she was in really confident, I thought. Definitely seems far smarter than the rest of understanding like themselves and what they want in life. and things like that. She already had like goals of where she wanted to be in life and I was like uh, enamored with which was awesome. Author Lynn Barrett Lee co-wrote a book about Becca with Becca's mother Sonia. From everything I've read about Becca, she she she's just come across throughout as being just a fabulous older sister, very maternal, like a little mum. She worked hard at school, she had big ambitions, she wanted to be a lawyer, um, so just a lovely daughter. She was great, like, really uh, protective of her friends. A really, like, loving person. Yeah, she was something special. 
Rebecca and Joshua met at this secondary school here where they enjoyed the same large group of friends, but they didn't start dating until their GCSE year. Now, Joshua was regarded as academically gifted and a charming boy. Even Rebecca's mother thought highly of him. She said of him that even though he towered above her and Rebecca, he had a round baby face and was soft-natured. From what Rebecca told me of him, uh, yeah, great student, normal 15-year-old kid. Everyone just thought he was cool. He seemed like a really genuinely nice guy. He was the life and soul of many parties, of even the classroom. He was, it wasn't difficult for him to make friends. He played rugby. He was thought of as the, the, the charming young man that every girl would want to go out with. Good looking, um, by all accounts very charismatic. The sort of boy who had a sort of coterie of other boys around him that sort of gathered people to him, very much top dog. I mean, I think he called himself that once. I'm top dog, that was his big thing. When Becca and Davies started dating in September 2009, Becca's family were delighted that she'd found such a nice young man who seemed to make her happy. According to friends and family, they were besotted with each other. Rebecca and Davis had the, the classic teenager relationship for the time, the fact that they would see each other at school, see each other a bit after school, and then want to talk the minute they got home on social media. So they would have 24-7 contact with each other. But at the time, and even today, that is something that teenagers do. Clearly, he made her happy, and she was very, very, I would say, very much in love. He'd spend uh, evenings having dinner at their house, weekends with them. Um, he made comments to Rebecca's mum that he would look after her and take care of her and that she was safe with him. For all intents and purposes, it seemed quite a healthy, normal, loving relationship. However, I think there's some slight indications of his controlling nature. The fact that he said things like, I will take care of her. She's safe with me, almost like he was the one in power. There was more to Joshua Davies than met the eye. His friend spoke of his need to be the leader, the one that everyone followed. He would quickly turn on those who said anything negative about him, happily voicing his aggression on social media or here at school, face to face. Joshua was a lad who found it very, very difficult to accept any kind of challenge. And he certainly didn't like any kind of rejection at all. And his friends said this, this kind of thing about him. He was all right, he was fine, until you somehow annoyed him. And then he would just, you know, change into a different person. People like Joshua aren't necessarily routinely violent, um, but what does tend to happen especially when they have some kind of rejection, is that the, a rage or a sense of entitlement um, builds up inside them, and it's that that can make them become violent. It was very similar to many narcissists. They don't take personal criticism very well. They will ice people who they think have, have belittled them and cut them out of their lives. And they will often bear grudges and vendettas against people for the most innocuous of perceived slights. Ominously for Becca, she would soon become the focus of Davy's anger. Three months into their relationship, during the Christmas holidays of 2009, Davies broke up with Becca unexpectedly. She was devastated. Becca was shocked beyond belief. She did not have any idea why he'd finished with her. Everything had been going well as far as she was concerned. They were happy together. Uh, and then suddenly, out of the blue, he didn't want to be with her anymore. You know, it's bad enough when somebody finishes with you when you know things are going wrong, but it just came out of the blue and she didn't understand. It was also a difficult time. Her parents had recently divorced, so she would have been feeling particularly vulnerable. Every teenager, when they have those that first relationship, it's really overpowering. They spent all their time together. He was her best friend, as well as her boyfriend. From that moment on, it was almost as though she became public enemy number one. 
you know, as far as Davis and his friends were concerned, she'd suddenly gone from being her, his girlfriend to being in some sort of enemy camp. This is where the other side of social media really hits, because if you break up in this situation, Rebecca would not only see him at school, but see him in the, the small town that they lived in, but also see activity online to know what he's doing, what he's posting, what he's saying. Now, whether that's nasty or not, she'll be able to see that. And that just adds to the pain. Josh's cruel and vindictive streak began to surface soon after the breakup. He announced here at school and on social media that he broke up with Rebecca because she was a slag, in his words, and was trying to get pregnant with his kid. But Rebecca would have none of it. She defended herself robustly from his bullying and refused to let him have the last word. And he hated her for it. I've come to Aberkenvig in Wales to investigate why, in 2010, Joshua Davies lured his ex-girlfriend Becca into a forest and then brutally killed her. I want to find out the role social media played in this horrific murder. This is a photograph of 15-year-old Becca Aylward and her boyfriend Joshua Davies before they broke up in Christmas 2009. And few could have anticipated the anger and resentment that this breakup would generate. Josh, though, was always determined to have the last word and took to social media to vent his feelings about Becca. Tragically, though, his actions would not be confined just to the online world. There were many issues surrounding social media and the risks and dangers it poses, one of which we always know is cyberbullying or online bullying. Now, Davis knows what he can say on social media. He can turn people against Rebecca. Maybe that deep down he wanted Rebecca back, so he thought, well, if I upset her, she's got to come to me. I'm the only person that's going to talk to her. That is control. And this is your classic bully tactics by using social media, because social media affords this 24-7. He was trying to make it as difficult as he could for Becca and would make up things about her and try and spread rumours about her so that other people would turn against her. It wasn't enough that he hated her. He had to make sure everybody else hated her as well. Rumours yeah. about Becca that I knew of were related to uh, pregnancy and also it was made up that she'd had like loads and loads of partners, her friendships with people as well, by saying she said different things about people that she hadn't said. Really, like, just to tore her away from her friends. When they went back to school after the Christmas holidays, Davies continued to try and persuade other students not to speak to Becca. But after school, he used private messages online to be friendly towards her. It was a master class in manipulation. They would talk uh, a lot on MSN. She'd send me screenshots of their, their conversations. And a lot of the time, they'd come home and actually have a good, genuinely really nice conversation. Like, he was so on and off with her, and she always did quite like him. It seems that they had an ongoing relationship, even though they weren't in a relationship. We have something called the push-pull effect in psychology, um, and it's used very much in domestic abuse and also grooming of people, that you, you pull them in with lots of emotion and love and adoration, and then you push them away with some cruel words or ending the relationship, and then you pull them back again. And the more you do that, the more you're messing with their head, and the more you're actually tying them in with you, you're emotionally attaching them to you, because they're so confused by it that they're actually wanting you more and I think because she was so young and this was her first relationship and of course she doesn't have any experience with relationships I think that actually made her want him more in spring 2010 despite being friendly to Becca in private in public Davies continued his war of words and his barrage of hatred started to become even more extreme so Becca stood up to Davies and defended her name. It led to a furious response. 
For Davies, that was probably something quite new, this person challenging him, this person publicly challenging his version of events, his truth that he wanted everyone to believe. And because of his narcissistic temperament, he could not cope with people publicly contradicting him. That would not do. During the summer term, Davies intensified his efforts to demoralise Becker on social media. And soon he advanced from insults to explicit threats to physically harm her. That shows that he was having to escalate things because he could no longer contain Rebecca and the risk to his reputation that she posed online, and he had to take those threats into the real world. Well, we know from the online chat histories and statements revealed by the police that far from fizzling out, the anger and resentment between the pair began to escalate, and in Josh's case, to disturbing levels. Clearly, what was going on online between them um, was one thing, but there was obviously at the same time or very soon after um, a much darker thing emerging, and that's what we now know um, was going on between him and his friends, that he'd started thinking about ways he could kill her. He occasionally would pepper his continual dialogue of I'm going to kill her with methods and how it would be done. He um, talked about pushing her off the edge of a quarry so she'd drown. Um, he talked about um, poisoning her at some length. And these seem so fanciful and outrageous that I think his peer group didn't pay them any notice. Because surely, if you're going to kill someone, you don't keep talking about it and incriminating yourself. He's got the idea in his head that he is going to kill her. And, and the fact that he's talking about different methods of killing her indicate that it's the killing her that is the important thing. He wants to enjoy doing it. She doesn't want her to be killed by somebody else. He wants to be there. He wants to be master of that. The fantasy really begins to be something that he thinks, I could do this. For everyone else, apart from him, it genuinely was a joke, because, like, I know the other guys, they did actually really like Becca. They thought he was joking. That's why it was so funny, because it's never going to happen, because it's impossible, because we all like her. Some of Davy's online threats were veiled in text-speak and accompanied by emojis, perhaps in case an adult read them and decided to intervene. Online conversations are very different to face-to-face -face conversations. If you say, I, I'm going to kill someone, lol, or smiley face, that takes some of the sting out of what's being said, especially as the person reading that can't hear your tone of voice, can't see your body language, doesn't know what you're doing with your face. It completely takes any menace out of, out of that sentence at all. But he also had that serious side to it that he was actually planning this. Without a doubt, this was planned. We know that from what happened. This is a psychopath, but able to convince his friends he's just a bit of a bully and having a laugh. Quite incredible. We could say that they thought he was joking. But even joking, it shows that we've become so desensitised by social media that these conversations take place and it's almost like they're living this kind of fantasy life that's not real. But what they didn't realise, that Joshua wasn't living a fantasy life. He was planning to do this in reality. After the school year ended, the feud between Josh and Rebecca appeared to die down. They even hung out together over the summer and rekindled their relationship. He may have been telling his friends online that he wanted to kill Rebecca, but how does that square with the fact they were getting on so well? I'm meeting criminologist Dr Elizabeth Yardley and forensic clinical psychologist Mike Berry to find out what they make of Davy's behaviour. 
He was making a threat to kill. Kids these days, 14, 15, they know what a threat to kill is and what that means. They've seen enough television programmes about that. No, I disagree with you. They don't understand the consequences of making a threat. So this was make-believe for Joshua's friend. I think they, they would have been reading these comments and, and chipping in and contributing, just with absolutely no, no idea of, of the consequences. Is he different online to the person he is in real life? Yes. One thing about the internet is it allows you to be much more yourself. It disinhibits. It's the effect of alcohol on, on, on the frontal lobes. When you put somebody in front of a computer, they can start being what they want to be. They can talk about the fantasies. The thing that he really wanted more than anything was control, and particularly control over Rebecca. And when they lose that control, they change the project, essentially. And they don't seek to control them anymore, they seek to destroy them. I've come to Wales to find out the role social media played in the brutal murder of 15-year-old Becca Aylward by her ex-boyfriend, Joshua Davies, in October 2010. It was the culmination of a cruel online hate campaign by Davies, which began when their three-month romance ended acrimoniously. From that moment on, he was determined she would never get the better of him, and he retaliated by making up lurid rumours online, including the fact that he claimed she'd had an abortion. When that didn't quieten her down, he then started talking more and more about murdering her and trying to rid her from his life once and for all. By the start of the 2010 summer holidays, Becca had endured a seven-month hate campaign by Davies. But then, over the break, Davies revived their relationship. Perhaps Becca hoped they could put all the animosity behind them. But in reality, for Davies, this was all about regaining control. Obviously, they had rekindled something over the summer, but clearly all wasn't well. Um, because she was certainly nervous about going back to school and everything that implied and her complicated relationship with him, which wasn't a relationship, but he was clearly very much on her mind. We know that she was hoping that they might be able to rekindle it, but clearly had reservations because she'd said to a school friend that she was nervous about going back. Becca mentioned once or twice our worries about going back into year 11. I could say maybe she had more enemies going into school. She was a bit nervous about it. One of the last couple of times I spoke to her, she just said, uh, <laughs> she just said she didn't think she was gonna uh, be alive for too long. She always felt threatened. I feel like it was related to Josh, in my mind, 100%. She hadn't felt like that, like, a year ago. It was chilling at the time, and still is. And after the holidays, following their return to school, Davies continued his constant dialogue with his friends on social media about killing Becca. Josh's mates admitted they were getting quite bored and tired about how much Josh was going on, about how much he hated and wanted to kill Rebecca. One of his best mates, Dan, told the court, you just ignored it. It was getting boring, he said. Perhaps this is why, when Josh returned to the subject in science class, some of his mates egged him on, and one went so far as to make a silly bet with him about what he would do if Josh went ahead with the murder. Josh Davidson's friends meet at a cafe regularly for breakfast. Now, in one of their conversations where they were talking about, once again, killing Becca, um, Josh Davis said to one of them, what would you do if I actually did do it? And um, he said, oh, I'd buy you breakfast. It's banal. What are you going to do if I really do kill her? I'll buy you breakfast. That is not menacing. That's bringing it back into the real world. Turns it into a joke almost for them, but not for him. I think that shows what element of boredom 
his peer group had with Davis and his continual vendetta against Rebecca. It clearly wasn't a serious monetary amount. It wasn't an impossible bet, such as I would bet you a million dollars, which of course is, is impossible. This just showed the boredom and disdain I think his peer group had for this constant vendetta. Just two days before the murder, Josh texted a friend. And don't say anything, but you may just owe me breakfast, he said, referring to a bet he'd made with Liam that Liam would have to pay for breakfast at this cafe if he went ahead with the murder. Liam responded, best text I've ever had, mate. If it's true, I'm happy to pay for your breakfast. Josh responded, well, hopefully by Friday, it will all be done and dusted. Revving him up, Liam responded, I'll hear all the details Saturday, sadistic bastard. Well, it seems that Josh's plans to murder Rebecca were well in motion, but why was his friend playing on with it? Did he not realise he was encouraging him? The state of mind that Davis is now in is that the plan to murder Rebecca has started. The message was part of the process. It is an awful shame that the friend didn't just suddenly realise what a dangerous person Davis was. On the 23rd of October 2010, on the first weekend of the school half term, Davies invited Rebecca to meet him here, close to his home. And given her soft spot for him, despite all the rumours he'd spread about her, Rebecca agreed. After a 10-month war of words with Davies, Becca must have felt relieved that her nightmare seemed finally to be over. Having spoken to him the night before and made all their arrangements, Becca was obviously really excited, uh, up very early in the morning. She'd chosen her clothes really carefully. She'd painted her nails. She'd done her hair really carefully, um, put on a bit of makeup. Basically done everything she could to make herself beautiful for him. Hoping, hoping this was the moment when they were gonna get back together and everything was gonna be okay. There was romance in the air as far as she was concerned. Not violence, and certainly not murder. For Joshua Davies, this was to be the climax of his deadly battle for control over Becca. While Josh hung out with his friends, Liam and Daniel, here at Daniel's house, Rebecca called to say she was ready and would be there soon. As soon as Josh hung up the phone in a sing-along voice, he started singing, today's the day. He explicitly told his friends he was going to meet Rebecca and then he was going to kill her. He said he'd be back soon because he didn't think it would take too long. Why on earth didn't Liam and Daniel take him seriously? Why didn't they take him at his word? Clearly, he's getting very excited about what he's going to do because this, this is something that he has been looking forward to. I think his friends must have suspected he was going to hurt her and he was going to bully her, but I don't think they thought he was going to kill her. Becca arrived at the meeting point as arranged. But with no sign of Davies and worried he'd stood her up, she called her mother, Sonia. But then Becca spotted Davies coming to meet her and ended the call, saying goodbye to her mother for the very last time. He takes her up to Pennsylvania Woods, which is a spot where a lot of the local kids would go and hang out. Um, 
Though, as Sonia said, not a place Becca would have ever hung out. She wasn't the sort of girl who'd go tramping through the woods. It, it remains a mystery why she went up with him willingly. We'll never know. Soon after entering the woods, Davies turned on Becca. First, he tried to break her neck. But when that failed, he grabbed a large rock. and bludgeoned Becca to death. The murder was brutal far more violence than was necessary to just kill Rebecca. I think that he enjoyed hurting her. That would have been the most distressing and horrific sight to see. And yet he coolly does it. And then so, so calculating when his friend says, are you with Rebecca? He replies, define with. That comment makes the hers stand up on the back of your neck. She had no idea it was coming, which probably in a lot of ways is a blessing. It would be worse if she had lots of defensive wounds and, and had, you know, knew exactly what was happening to her. So we can take maybe some blessing from the fact that she probably died quite quickly, not knowing what was happening. I wonder if Davies had planned to murder Becca from the moment his social media vendetta began. Criminologist Dr Liz Yardley and psychologist Mike Berry might have the answer. Is Joshua a psychopath? Well, he's somebody who does display some psychopathic traits and behaviours, I think. So there's a lack of remorse, there's a lack of empathy, there's a failure to accept responsibility for his own actions, there's, there's a manipulativeness about him. I, I disagree with you. I don't think there's anything in his history to suggest that he was psychopathic. Control, narcissism, uh, yeah, lack of control, remorse, yeah. manipulation, kind of bullying, humiliations upon, upon his friends. No history of any antisocial behaviour, no history of criminality that we would expect to see in a 16-year-old psychopath. I suppose I think of psychopathy as a, as a spectrum. At one extreme end, you, you have got people who are undoubtedly psychopaths at the other end, people who absolutely aren't. And I do think he is kind of occupying this middle ground here. But what we really need to remember here is that he knew exactly what he was doing when he killed her. He knew what he was doing was wrong. So, so let's not kind of labour under the impression that, that he was out of his mind or that he wasn't responsible for this. When we look at the fact that he doesn't have a history of violence, many people think, well, well that's really shocking. He literally turns overnight from this average schoolboy into this killer. But actually, what he has got a history of is controlling and jealous and possessive behaviour. That is the biggest risk factor. In 2010, the village of Aberkenvig in Wales was shocked by the brutal murder of a teenage girl by her ex-boyfriend, following months of vicious threats on social media. This is where 15-year-old Rebecca Aylward took her final steps. She was invited up here by her ex-boyfriend, Joshua Davies. She thought he was going to ask her out again. Instead, he battered her head in with a stone and left her lying face down in the ground. Joshua then texted his friends, Liam and Daniel, and asked them to meet him up here in the forest. But Liam had a bad leg and was left behind. But when Daniel arrived here and connected with Joshua, he saw Rebecca lying on the ground and immediately realised what had happened. 
Joshua had done what he said he'd do. He called his friends up to see the body because he was proud of what he'd done. He'd actually gone through with what he said he was going to do and he thought that when his friends saw that, he'd be the hero. Daniel claimed that when he saw Rebecca's body lying on the floor, he said it felt like he'd walked into a cold shower. He suddenly felt numb, he felt very dizzy and shuddery, and it didn't seem real. And he immediately wanted to get away from there. Davies was completely different. He seemed to be more concerned that he didn't have any blood on himself. So already he was thinking about getting his way out of this situation. Davis then tells him that he's killed her by hitting her with a rock and that he had to kill her with a rock because she wouldn't stop screaming. He says that um, he's tried to kill her by strangling her and also getting her in a neck hold, as he put it, but that it was too difficult. And apparently he relates all this to Daniel with absolutely no emotion, no remorse, nothing. Davies and Daniel left the forest, met up with Liam and went to Daniel's house. Davies told Liam to delete all his messages from that day and said, if anyone asks, I've been here with you all the time. Liam agreed to keep his secret. Davis does what most offenders will try and do, which is to cover their tracks. This is suddenly the classic case of not understanding technology and messaging thinking that if you delete them, they've gone. We know that they haven't gone. Davies' friends agreed to be his alibi. He then went online to back up his story, saying on Facebook, Joshua D is still chilling with Liam and Daniel. Davies even referred obliquely to a playful bet from one of his friends, offering him a free breakfast if he killed Becca. The next behaviours we see from Davies are him laying the groundwork of his alibis posting on social media that he'd been relaxing all day, watching videos, providing this very dark joke about having had a great breakfast that day. Again, this just shows the amount of disregard he had for human life by making that very sick joke. Later that day, when Becca didn't return home, her mom rang Davies and asked him where she was. He said they hadn't met up in the end, and he thought she'd gone to see a different Josh instead. Becca couldn't be located, and as news of her disappearance spread, her friends started messaging each other online. Chillingly, the person who knew exactly where she was joined in. He is just basically calmly going through the process of covering his tracks, making sure that everybody is looking elsewhere. He probably wants to run. He probably wants to get as far away as possible, but he can't do that because that shows guilt. So he's in a quandary. So you've got, you've got a bit of chaotic behaviour going on here that he's doing bits of everything. He's trying to control his friends, he's trying to control evidence, but he's also trying to be this wonderful person that at school and friends think he is, this wonderful, great guy. But he can't be both. And he probably thought he was being quite clever, and with the kind of narcissistic personality that he had, he wouldn't even have considered that he wasn't cleverer than everybody else. There will always be an element of naivety in most offender behaviour. Did he really believe he could get away with murder? He's trying to get rid of his digital footprint, but he's actually shown an admitted murder to a friend by showing them the body. How does that work? So, in many ways, it's this control. He was proud of what he did, but in the other aspect, naive in that he felt he wanted to get away with it, but he couldn't. So there is naivety, but there's also pride in what he actually achieved. That's very dangerous. Despite Davies' attempts to cover his tracks online and delete various text messages, the net was already closing in. By 7.45 a.m., Liam had already cracked 
telling his parents everything he knew about the murder. Shortly after, the police arrested Josh, Liam and Daniel and brought them here to Cardiff Bay Police Station. But Davy still brazened it out. He told the police that, yes, Rebecca was murdered, but he didn't do it. He blamed his best friend, Daniel. One of the other things I find really, really shocking is the ease with which he apparently decided he'd fit up his supposed best friend. It almost beggars belief that he thought that anybody would possibly believe him. He wouldn't have thought twice about blaming somebody else, and he would have been very happy to see that person go to prison, probably, for it, with no remorse whatsoever. Throughout the trial, Davies protested his innocence and constantly blamed his best friend, Daniel, for Becca's murder. But the jury found Davies guilty, and he was jailed for life with a minimum of 14 years. At a trial, he appeared to be distant as if he had no interest in his own trial, in his own future. And I think at that age, it should be terrifying uh, to be told that if you're found guilty, the sentence will have to be one of life imprisonment. Well, to a boy of that age, no more girlfriends, no university, no freedom, for who knows how many years. But he showed no reaction. As a criminologist, I know it's possible to group online killers into different categories, such as predator, imposter, or reactor. I'm meeting experts Dr. Liz Yardley and psychologist Mike Berry to find out what sort of social media murderer Davies was. Liz, what kind of killer was Davies? Well, I'd describe Davies as an informer type of, of killer who uses social media. And, and this is the, the type of person who will use social media to communicate an intention to kill somebody, to, to inform their, their social media followers that they have just killed someone, or both. So they're using it as a communicative tool around murder. Why was he so keen to tell everybody what he was going to do if he didn't care what they, they thought? Well, I think for him it was it was a performance, essentially. It was, was asserting power because he felt that he'd lost quite a lot of control in, in that relationship with Rebecca. But here was a way of, of having a new kind of status, a new identity. So, so I think that was something that he gained quite a lot of pleasure from. Without social media, do you think Rebecca would still be alive today? I think there's a possibility without it that after a couple of months they would have broken up from school and they would have gone their separate ways. So in many ways, the internet kept the fire going and sped up the whole process. What caused these murderous thoughts in the first place? I think he didn't like being uh, out of control. I think he didn't like uh, the threat that had to his ego to have somebody in control of things when he wanted to be in control. Liz, how could this tragedy have been avoided? I think the key thing that we need to be looking at here isn't necessarily social media, but young people's relationships and the nature of those relationships. Now, teenagers do tend to be quite intense in terms of their emotions, but when you see the kind of controlling and jealous and possessive behaviour that Dave has exhibited towards Rebecca, that's a cause for concern for me, and that's where we need to educate young people. But it's that intensity, that pressure cooker that social media can sometimes become, has played quite a large role in this case. The unreal world of social media created an environment where a bright young teenager literally talked himself into the act of murder. Online threats are no less real than the spoken word, and in this instance led to a needless and tragic murder.